So I'm here with Irvin Firm, a very important Austrian artist who we're very, very happy to work with. And this is a, this is a very big show, yeah? Oh, it is, it is, it is. And especially exciting because I'm able to show many pieces outside here, outside sculptures, yeah. and that's fantastic. Which is one of the wonderful things about this gallery, built deliberately yes. so that we can have that interaction between exactly. indoors and, also and outdoors. The, exactly, and also the indoor space and the outdoor space, it works very well mm -hmm. together. And what is important for me also, you have a great program, you showed many great of my colleagues, and I'm very happy to be a part of this. And one of the reasons we were very keen to work with you is we're an organization that presents and investigates sculpture. Yeah, yeah. And all of your practice is about what sculpture can be, the potential of sculpture, the potential of anything to be sculpture. Yeah, true. It started from the beginning. I started to be interested in making a research on sculpture because I wanted to become a painter. <laughs> <laughs> But this didn't work out. <laughs> but why didn't it work out? Yeah, I don't know, because they put me in the sculpture class, not in the painting class, in the beginning of my studies. But then, did you feel this affinity to material, to space? No, frankly, first, first not, because first, uh, at that time, sculpture was for me big black pieces full of pigeon shit. Yeah. It's what I, what I got. And I, had to, I really had to discover the world of sculpture by making research. What is it? Two to three dimensionality, mass, volume, skin, surface, time and all this. Yeah. So interestingly, those are all quite formal values around sculpture, the volume, the size, the shape, the surface. Um, you added time to this idea and from that the one minute sculptures, I guess, were, were absolutely, born. Absolutely, absolutely. But you know, time was always an important factor in sculpture because when you have a, a solid 3D, three dimensional sculpture you have to walk around to look at it properly mm -hmm. and that costs time mm -hmm. that's consuming time so the time time was always an important factor so but i guess in the one minute sculpture it kind of not that they necessarily have to be one minute i suppose it sort of formalizes that arrangement and also yeah. you're asking another person to put themselves into your imaginative space yes yes but one minute is just a synonym for short it can be two minutes or 10 seconds, it doesn't matter. But the most important thing is that I invite the public to perform after my instructions with a daily life object. And they create what I call one minute sculpture. So it's a short living sculpture. And that kind of really caught the imaginations of people, particularly people like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, who then asked you to work yeah. with them, to collaborate with them in the making of their, their because, video. Yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm thinking about this, why were these pieces so successful? Because I think because they're close to the absurd, but also close to our daily life experiences. And on the other side, it's so far away, and it's very much about psychology, also philosophy. Yeah, we all live in a different reality. I mean, imagine we, have, we are here now, yeah, mm -hmm. in Yorkshire Sculpture Park. At the same time, we have people, oligarchs or whatever, they live insanely rich and I mean, it's just outrageous. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we have people in the Andaman Islands or at the Amazon River still hunting with bow and arrow. The same year, the same time, now on the same world, they all have a very different reality. And that's so exciting. Yeah. And so when we're able to look, go a step aside and look onto our reality from an absurd perspective, then we might see something else. And that's, that's exciting, that's good. And the show is called The Trap of the Truth. Yeah. And that, um, that has a relationship to sort of philosophical debate over, I guess, certainly since Plato and, yes. and the allegory of the cave, yes. which is this very famous story about yes. how people, th th they see their shadows cast against the wall exactly. uh, within the cave. They think that that's their life. Exactly. And it's only when they're unchained and let out of the cave that they see that there is a completely different reality. Yeah. Or Descartes who said, I mean, when we talk, I see you and you see me, but we both don't know if we exist like we see each other. So maybe it's just an, a very personal uh, imagination of something of reality. That's all very exciting. And there's another kind of distortion going on here. Well, this is, uh, they, they reach back to nearly my beginning nearly. At the beginning in the late eighties, I was covering pedestals and plinths with clothes. Mm -hmm. So in the late 80s, there would not, would not have been legs, but just standing this on the floor, and covered was that, pedestals. Was that because you had access to free clothing? You exactly. had cheap, cheap exactly. materials. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I could play around with them. Yeah. Look, it's dusty here too. 
And because clothes is in a way the second skin. And when we're dealing about sculpture, when we're dealing with sculpture, remember the Roman sculptures or the, or, or the Greek sculptures showing heroes and horses and atlas and whatever, massive bodies and massive sculptures, but they were just defined by a very thin layer of skin, of bronze skin. So, and then I thought, okay, wait a moment. Um, when we wear this, pullovers and so forth, it's in a way the second skin. Yeah. So why not using this as, in, a, in the same way as the bronze in the past, why not using this today mm. as a sculptural medium? And for um, example, here, sorry, and here you see it, um, these uh, um, several, I don't know how many, maybe 17 socks pulled over each other and all of a sudden the doubling or the multiplying of the surface made it sculptural. And it's the same with sweaters. Because the volume expanded. Yeah, it's, yeah. It sh changed its shape in relation to exactly. the, in response to the layering. Yeah. And you could do the same. You could make it a skinnier, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, a yeah, less sure. volumetric sculpture. Yeah, sure. And on the one side, it has, it has also a social aspect because we all know homeless people, mm. they're wearing mostly their wardrobe they owe on their body. And they, it's the same effect. So it's so interesting. Yeah? Mm. And these pieces, these, these box-like pieces, as though the, the figures have somehow swallowed the, the box that the dress came in or the jacket came in. It's another, it, it was it's the another iteration of the plinth. Yeah, it was the plinth in the beginning. It were dressed plinths. Mm. But these are kind of quite fancy boots, yes? They're not ordinary <laughs> boots. No, some are really ordinary, some are not. Yeah. Actually, it was also because I was in, invited by an iconic, again, we have icons, brand, yeah. Hermes, to interpret uh, Hermes world. At first I was shocked and I said, what do I do with Hermes? Because there is one of the richest brands and the clothes are very, very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And, but then I thought, hmm, but maybe that's even interesting. And then they made um, pieces for me and I could use them. And all of a sudden the luxury and the, uh, it tra tra transferred into a very absurd a um, uh, thing which I liked very much. Uh. Because you question that desire for yeah, people yeah. to yeah. own a scarf that costs £15,000. On the one side, when we buy new clothes, we invent ourselves new. Mm. I know it from myself. When mm. I go shopping and I want to buy a new suit or jacket or whatever, I have the feeling I have the ab ability to invent myself, like mm. when you have a, a new haircut. Mm -hmm. With me, it's not much about new haircuts, but it's about clothes. And that's so interesting because it's changed psychology and you have the chance to renew yourself. It's the same here. And you can become addicted to it, that desire to, for the label to yeah. be evident. And it's not only showing, uh, having the possibility of a new personality, it's also showing wealth and showing, um, and showing status and so on. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I know, it's a, it's a fact I like very much. And what about this bar, this gherkin? <laughs> it's a Danish designer, okay. Jakobsen. He became very famous also in the 60s, 50s and 60s. And he made these great chairs, these one chairs. And he made also this table. And this table is penetrated by uh, a pickle. And why a pickle? Why not? But why pickle for you? <laughs> because it's so male, no? <laughs> it's not just because it's male. In fact, as we're standing here, we're looking at this and we're looking at der Gurk out there, which is a much bigger pickle yeah. out, outdoors. Um, but the pickle is a really important part of your practice. It's been, I don't know for how long you've been using yeah, this image yeah. of the pickle. Yeah. But it all started very little because I got invited by this famous economy magazine in Austria. It's called Gewinn. So it's about economy, success, money and all this. And they are giving an award every second year to the most successful firms and managers. And they asked me to make this award, a sculpture for the award. And I said, OK, wait a moment, it would be great to offer them a pickle. So the winner would get a pickle. You know what it means to get a pickle. It's an insult. Yeah. So, <laughs> and they did not accept it, of course. Oh, funny. So, <laughs> but this brought me to but idea. But why did you want to? Because you disapproved of this award, of this... Uh, I, found, I found it ridiculous. Yeah. That people were getting an award for making money, for making yeah, capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they get money anyway, so it's, yeah. they are awarded enough. Yeah. But anyway, and, and then they didn't accept it. But anyway, two years later, I was invited by, there's a very important and big dance festival in Austria. It's called Tanzquartier. They asked me for an award because they wanted to give an award to the best dancer. And I came back to this idea because it was there already. And they liked it. So yeah. they got the, uh, the picture. Yeah. And, then I, and then I made the first uh, pickle work about myself. It's a self-portrait. 
as pickles, and mm. it's, um, it's, it's an entire um, glass of pickles, 36 pickles, and it's called Sef Potri as pickles. But also the pickle has this sort of symbolic force in yeah. Austria. They're what people ordinarily eat. It's just a it very was ordinary thing. Class, sorry, working class food. And, uh, you know, we're a winter country where we uh, have no vegetables in the winter. So they were kind of, you know, making sauerkraut and, and salted and, and, and uh, pickles in vinegar and, and sausages and all this. And yeah, this was a part of, of my life when I grew up, the sausage and the pickles. And also, it's just really great to look at these three abstract sculptures, which are anthropomorphic sausages yeah. that have been given a human aspect. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so interesting how you've given them these characters through it, their attitudes and, and also through yeah. their colours and scale. But still they are called, remember, abstract sculptures. Yeah. Because I'm working a lot with realism and I wanted to create a figure, a realistic figure, without parts of human beings. But I wanted to choose biological material in a way, and sausage is a biological material. Yeah. So I combined this sausage biological material, it's from an intestine and stiffed with, with mashed meat, and then you have a sausage, but then you create something out of it. Then I, I thought, but maybe it's much more interesting to call it abstract sculptures because then the people think, oh my God, I see a figure, but it's called abstract, so maybe I did overdo something here? And I, I tried to play with this. Yeah. And what about, we also here we have Hypnos, which is this amazing Hypnosis, yeah. polished aluminium piece. Yeah. And we've spoken a little bit about psychology. And I, you know, this piece, I mean, literally, it's a man with his head in the clouds, yeah. um, in his own mind exactly, space. Exactly, not seeing anything. But I made, actually, this is also related to another piece, what I did. Because in, I have the studio in the countryside in Austria, you've mm -hmm. been there, you know it. It's a flat country and there, it, it was, um, Austria was, Catholic Church from 2000 years. And uh, we have all these uh, 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 Baroque and uh, Catholic figures standing outside, mostly holy people and so. And um, they're everywhere because it was a tradition in the past. And I wanted to try and put the person there on, during my research on what is a sculpture. If I'm standing quiet, is, it's an action, but can this be transformed into a sculpture? What do I have to do? Do I have to squeeze it? Do I have to slow it down? Do I have to stretch it? Things like that. So I asked a guy to stand for, from sunrise to sun, sunset, from sunrise to sunset. In the summer, it's 12 hours or more even. And, uh, but nobody can stand quiet like this, yeah? Nobody can do this. So mm. I hired medical hypnotizers, a man and a woman. And they were talking to the guy. He was standing and we filmed him. And they were talking to the guy and uh, telling him, you are ground and you get roots and you ground with the area. He was ha having a hat because of the sun. And he was really standing for, for 12 hours. Wow. And this is a bit related to this, mm. to this work, yeah? So did you want to see, in doing that, did you want to see what the effect of a kind of a powerful mind would be on another yes. human being? You know, when I, when I make one minute sculptures, I always invite people to think in a certain way about something. Mm. So the mindset, uh, it's very important. I'm working very hard on, on these pieces. I mean, since many years, I take it re really seriously. It's my big joy and my fun, but also my struggle. I fight every single day because I have the feeling I have to get better and things are leading me, the work is leading me. As soon as I've learned to expect that I'm not only the artist and the director in directing the work and producing them, but also I've learned that the sculptures are pulling me in in a certain way and that I have sometimes to follow them. It creates um, a freedom, but also a very specific tension. As an artist, it's most important that the work is seen. The best painting, let's say it's Mona Lisa, whatever, in the basement means nothing. If there is nobody who can read it and who can enjoy it and they can't really estimate its artificial value, I'm not talking about the uh, money value, it's, it's fantastic. Without this, the best artwork doesn't make any sense. And it's the same for me here. So people are needed to enjoy it, to read it, to be able to go into the work and make it rich. People make the work rich, not, not from the other point.
So I hope that people come and accept my invitation to look at the work. Some people would, might uh, follow the instructions and realize in one minute sculptures, and others would like just to, to see the work and, yeah, and to look to the second layer and the third layer. It's a lot about psychology, philosophy sometimes, and questions about our life. And what's most important is, this I say at the last, statement. I'm not answering questions or asking questions about the big issues of our life, where we go and where we come from, but I ask questions, what do we wear, what do I eat tomorrow, and who do I want to be?